Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 325th New Social Environment. I am Jess Chen, Events Assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversa conversation between Monica Baer and Tom McGlynn. We're also thrilled to have our special projects associate, Malvika Jolly, here, who will read to close today's program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on the Nape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lani Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom, and recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Monica Baer lives and works in Berlin. Her exhibition, Loose Change, is currently on view at Green Naftali Gallery until June 26th, and an upcoming solo exhibition will open at the Kunsthalle Bern in fall 2021. She was the winner of Berlin's Hanna Hoch Prize for Lifetime Achievement in 2019. She is joined by artist, writer, and independent curator Tom McGlynn, who is based in the New York City area. His work is represented in the permanent collections of the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Cooper, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum of the Smithsonian. He is the director of Beautiful Fields, an organization dedicated to socially engaged curatorial projects, and is also currently a visiting lecturer at Parsons School of Design, the New School, as well as an editor at large for The Rail. Tom, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Jess. Um, as always, it's a pleasure to be here for the new, uh, the new social environment and a real pleasure to welcome Monica Baer, who um, on the occasion of her current show at Green Naftali, which is entitled Loose Change. And uh, why don't we just like launch right into the show, Monica? Um, here's an installation view of a couple of paintings um, I wasn't as familiar with your work as it seems like many other people are. Uh, so, but so for me, I, I came to it with some really fresh, uh, no preconceptions about the work, uh, some really fresh eyes. And uh, one of the things when I walked into the space that I noticed right away was this overwhelming feeling of like chromaticism. There was a chromatic um, kind of cloud permeating the, the space between the paintings. Even before I got into the kind of granular aspect of the, the representational abstract elements. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but connect that to uh, Goethe and Goethe's theory of colors. And uh, I thought of, uh, Philip Otto Runge, you know, the, the, the romantic painter and, and his, uh, you know, his deployment of color symbolically. <clears throat> I mean, it's not at all the same as yours, but I, I, I wonder if you feel a connection to that um, tradition of using color symbolically or psychologically rather than phenomenologically. Yes, thank you very much. I would never have thought of uh, either Goethe uh, nor Philip Otto Runge, but thank you for that. Um, it's interesting with Runge, and now that you point this out, I think usually um, or often color is uh, more a motif in itself, for, especially when the work, when the paintings tend to be monochromes. There are blue paintings, which are the breast paintings, the blue paintings, there are red paintings with chain swimming, swinging to and fro. So often um, the color of the painting will be not dominated by a certain color, a certain uh, cobalt blue or so, which you know, in those paintings was supposed to mimic genes. And in these paintings, I must say that I've, I haven't seen them together because I couldn't travel. So I haven't seen the show myself. Oh. I, don't have, I don't have the knowledge of the effect of the colors together. I've seen half of them in Berlin together and the other half in Los Angeles. 
But in this case, I think the um, in the tree paintings, the colors take their cue, cue from the impact of the light in Los Angeles coming from Berlin and the unabashedness of these, you know, pastel extravagant skies, I suppose, that um, for that reason, I think that's just been taken up. And then it isn't even, for my perception, isn't even that exaggerated, you know? Right. Uh, I don't perceive it as that artificial. Um, I guess I was thinking about chromaticism in terms of the universal too. I'm I'm totally projecting this, you know. Uh, okay, so, just go pro go and project go. Yeah, on. yeah I mean, I, you know, so the idea of like you know, a, a lot of color theorists don't like Goethe's theory of colors because they find it too, you know, uh, subjective. They find it too um, psychologically based rather than empirically based. But I find I did find a correlation between how you're using color as a trope in your work and, and that connection. I, I definitely wow. saw that connection. What is the connection that you saw? That, that when you include the, like a spectral chroma, rather than, you know, you know uh, opposing yellow to orange mm. and stuff like that, it implies a, a universal. It implies a universal uh, kind of citizen of the world type of, it, it implies a holistic uh, vision. Um, and there is, there is, to me, there is this uh, ideal connected to it that is, um, you know, kind of an ideal of transcendence or an ideal of uh, inclusion. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the spectrum has been adopted by the LGBTQ community uh, as that. But I remember before it was adopted by Jesse Jackson. Yeah, exactly in Rainbow Coalition, you know, and I think the idea was to express the universal. And um, so that was the connection I was making with like German idealism, that it was a, a universal projection of a kind of a holistic vision of, um, you know, human uh, phenomenological interaction, uh, but, but kind of psychologically based. I, I see your work is very psychological. Yes. Um, just to, to, uh, just to uh, go back to the spectrum, spectral colors, they appear in the in the exhibition, my first exhibition in New York, uh, called um, "On Hold," with alcohol take, you know, with alcohol, alcohol as the central topic. There were a set of black paintings, and they have the spectral colors, like the rainbow colors, set next to each other, like like uh, bird droppings or something squashed from a tooth a tooth uh, paste tube, and some of these. For instance, the one on the left, I mean, you can't go that near. It's sort of coming down from the top. At the top, at the top uh, edge of the painting, it sort of drops, they come down. They've been squashed there from tubes. Right. So I mix the colors in, in, and then put them in a tube and then squash them out again. So it's the rainbow, so-called rainbow colors next to each other. So that's a very corporal version of, uh, you know, the transcendent shining in through a painting. Uh, that's maybe yes. the opposite. But in these new paintings, I guess the light, the light in the, the depicted light in the tree paintings, it's more like that. The, uh, the way that the, you see these, these diagonals coming down, that's the kind of impact of those colors that are used themselves. So the light is more like something that's crashing down onto that painted tree stump. And yes, I think the colors aren't employed consciously as symbolic, but usually they are, for instance, in the one droplet, which is 3D droplet on the, on the canvas, one is red and blue. It does go through my mind. This red and blue. What that all that could stand for, you know? What what that mm. what that color combination holds? Yes. So it is color is a motif or it's symbolic. It is less less in interesting or great color combinations or very interesting choice of color. So I'm not that interested. A painting doesn't have to be interesting color wise. It's more like color has a secondary, you know, at the most, a secondary role uh, insofar as what do I need for the painting, you know? Yes. I, I, don't, I don't want it to be obviously interesting color-wise. Right, right. No, I, I get that. And, and even in these, these, these tree paintings on the wall that kind of operates as this proscenium uh, threshold, you can see kind of like graffiti type, like color stains on those walls. So it's, it's, it's kind of like what you were doing with the paintings in on hold, like there are these quotations 
you make it clear with these quotations within the painting that the color is not representational. No, no. not no, not nece no, not necessarily at all. And also, when you talk about qu qu uh, kind of quotations, you mean there's a little on one of those walls there kind of there's a sort of painterliness activity. Yeah, like a graffiti kind of. Yeah. yeah. If I do something like that, I mean, it's not something I plan, but if I do something like that, it does refer, it does point to someone did this, you know. Right. Sort of, right, but it's a, it's a picture of a picture. Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 kind of breaking that you know that you know that brief towards illusionism. It 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 interrupts that, and you do that in, in throughout your work. You there's this there's this intention to break the illustrative via yeah. the via the illustrative, which is fine. Yeah. I love that irony, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I try to break the. I try to break the um, homogeneity of the supposed homogeneity of the painting. So yeah, in these paintings, for, and you can't, probably can't see it now on this slide, but in this painting, this is maybe rare because I made this kind of gestural painting, in which you see in the background. I made that first as a background. So there's a lot of distance in there trying to make that kind of painting because I need it as a background. And then over this is painted white as a kind of veil. And then in the foreground is this drunkard um, taking the idea of this drunk head, this huh, desolation and excess combination as taken from um, Enzo's dead mother, the drawing of his dead mother with medicine bottles. Oh yeah, there, you see this person, uh -huh. they're looking out at us. But on top of the painting is also, as you say, kind of graffiti-like drawings of animals invented on the, one. On the upper left of this painting, there's like- yeah, yeah, to the right, there's a green parrot and up there there's sort of invented animals. And on the left, you see this green, blue, white. That's my, you know, with my fingers, I'm putting paint on top of the up, utter, uppermost layer. And right. for me, because these are kind of stage stages or staged regions of stagedness or staging, all these marks uh, point to something that happened. So somebody passed through and touched it, or then somebody, you know, of course it's me, but it's versions of myself in sort of kind of guises doing these painterly things. And right. it's, though it sounds so distant, and in a way it is, it's, um, it's a, in all the work, there's a sort of um, coming together of distance and skepticism and watching myself go forth and on the, and simultaneously a really getting into, getting worked up really getting into what I'm doing. So I'm fully identified to the point of psychological crisis, for instance, not always, but sometimes. And at the same time, I'm watching myself doing it. It doesn't make it easier or lighter, but it accounts for the stretch, uh, the stretch and the scope of what's happening in one painting, I guess. Right, and, and for me, that's, you know, it's, it's both a psychological and pictorial irony. Uh, I don't know. I think about the word irony, and mm, I don't know if I, if I don't know if I, it's a, I don't know if I have a better word than irony because. Let's have a look at matchstick painting from the show now. Maybe that red one, or anyone. Maybe the red one, which was on. Yeah, exactly. Ah, it's difficult in the slide as far as I can see. So. Mm, it's very difficult to see. So there's this. I think it's cadmium. Um, violet red wash in the background, which just pigment and acrylic. And this green stuff down, coming down is fuchsite. It's a mineral. It's like emeralds. It looks like emeralds. It's a so it's little tiny little granule, granules, whatever the word is. And there's, what's it called? Hema um, malachite in it. Right. And I've also painted with oil into it. So there's this, on the one hand, you could say, oh, Monica, Monica was making a joke about painterliness, which I have done, you know, I have enjoyed, but in this case, that's not what I'm doing. I'm more making a space on the grounds of these painterly options uh, and allowing turbulences to pick up speed, let's put it that way, and then set these match sticks on top. So I don't know if it's irony, maybe it's a fond, a, a fond but very, no, a distance but very fond relationship to the materials I use, you know, and the options I choose. 
you know, there's a, I, uh, I know what you mean about finding another word for irony. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I, when I, I usually go to Blanche show when I think about trying to find another word uh, for that and uh, the tension between the image and what the image is trying to project and what the image actually projects and all of that. And he, you know, he uses the term an in, in interruptive becoming and an interdiction. And I think it's probably more accurate in terms of your work, like an interdiction rather than um, say like a pat iron, ironic joke. What does uh, interdiction mean? There's know. a speaking, speaking between, you know, um, what is, what's the German word for speaking between? Uh, it's like interrupting. But no, correspondence, like the word for correspondence. I can't think of another word than correspondence. Yes. I can't think of another one in there right now. But anyway, I, I, I understand, you know, that there can be kind of like a, a, a summary understanding of, of irony as being unsophisticated and just a joke. But I, I, I don't necessarily mean it in that regard. I, I mean it in, in terms of like a very serious investigation of, of painting. Uh, and, well, I'm, and I'm, fully, I'm, I'm fully against any kind of painterly heroism. So yes. therefore, if I'm painting a big format or therefore in this exhibition with five large paintings with one central motif, I am wary of what I may be presenting or staging without you know, being conscious of it, namely um, a kind of monolithic affirmative um, um, relationship to what a painting can stand for. I'm, a, I'm sort of against that. And that's why this kind of play comes into it or counter, um, counter activity will take place. For, for instance, in this case, A between the paintings, B between uh, the tree and the droplet, and also C between the fact that I'm, I've got this phallic, I mean, sorry, this really central phallic thing in the middle of a painting, more or less, that's tilted, and I'm saying it's a tree. I know this is a very obvious thing. I'm not even gonna, I don't have to go into it, but it's like the most obvious formal and content point that I'm sort of, that you have to sort of just get over very fast, you know? Right. To proceed To proceed looking at a painting. So there again, there's this kind of antagonism, like, yeah, really? You're gonna have a sausage colored tree trunk in the middle of a painting as the, that's what you're staging. So that's what I mean. Right, like a pink, a pink tree trunk, yeah. Very, yeah. <laughs> But I, you know, we talked about it in our, our previous meeting, Monica, Monica, about skepticism. You know, so maybe more than irony, there's there's a a kind of sincere skepticism that is at work. I was thinking about what we were saying. You know, uh, I remember once Amy was talking about painting, and she said, "Well, maybe her attitude is yes, but," and I remember thinking myself, my attitude would have been early on, no, but. Right. When I started studying, but the butt is really big. Yes. My, it's no, but there's a very big sort of vital, alive, throbbing butt. <laughs> I mean, with one D. Ah. <laughs> going, for, you know, going for it. So in a way, because the higher, the higher the skepticism, the more I expect, or the more I expect, the less uh, I can be satisfied. Or, you know, so it's a kind of scales of, you know, desire, expectation, disappointment, demanding, uh, all these things that I, uh, that, that is what makes the relationship to painting, I don't know, fraught is maybe the wrong word, but tense. <laughs> and maybe that's more than skepticism, you know, it isn't like, yeah, you know what, I'm not, you know, painting, so what? I mean, yeah, most paintings in the world are awful and the concept, <laughs> I mean, anyway, yeah, say. <laughs> but I think if you are skeptical of painting, and you do it nevertheless, either you're detached, like really detached, and then you have a kind of strategy maybe, or you're very invested because you're yeah. doing it nevertheless. I mean, it's, it's also not news for me. So this is something that comes from, the, from studying in the 80s. You know, I'm, I'm over it. I don't yeah. sit there, you know, wringing my hands, worrying about painting. I worry about, you know, more like sub-questions, you know. I'm used to it. It's part of my stance, you know. 
Yes, 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 uh, of course. It's a, very dated, it's a very dated problem. I, I find it still effective and I also, and it affects also the way I look at paintings or also other works because it's maybe, and maybe more analytical or analytical something, how something is done and mainly what of the desire, which desire reveals itself. Right. Which, desi which actual de desire of the person who makes the painting is actually revealing himself if the person knows it or not, doesn't matter. So maybe that's that kind of view because the paintings are tested so strongly, you know? Uh, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, the atmosphere of California uh, are these like specific trees? Are these like palm trees or eucalyptus trees? Or yes, I think they're. I think they are triggered by my um, by my uh, uh, my absolute astonishment of seeing these eucalyptus trees like flinging off their bark. Yes. Every September, they it's like with abandon. It just doesn't sort of demurely drop off. It's sort of they just chuck it around. Yes. And it's got big pieces lying quite far away from the trunks, and I saw that. And I don't know if it's for all of them, but some of them they grow spirally, right? So that means that they shed the bark. There's a more tension to shed, you know, to chuck it off because they're, they're growing like that. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's correct, yeah. Um, so yeah, so <clears throat> they're exfoliating. In they the are exfoliating, yeah. They're actually, yeah, I thought quite with abandon, yeah. And you know, I th I'm pretty sure I'm not certain about this, but just like the palm trees in the West Coast, they're introduced. I think they were introduced from uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, that also set me thinking about you know the fact that are you teaching at UCLA currently? No, I have at the moment. I'm teaching in Frankfurt. It's, it's oh, okay. Yeah. So, so, but there's that. There's that, you know, that California thing and uh, the artificiality of that environment. And um, immediately, you know, I think I think of when I think of like pictorial irony and a depiction of like L.A., I think of Ed, Ed Ruscha. I think of Ed Ruscha's work. And uh, <clears throat> I think he's a really good example of somebody who's very sophisticated in a very deadpan kind of way about uh, illusionism and about uh, you know how how a, a painting is illustrative of itself, but also illustrative of the fact that it's an illusion. So it it undermines itself. Um, this this is one of my favorite ever shows because the subject is this bird who's angry at the artificiality of the fact that, you know, it's plaster and not milk. So it's, it's, a, com it's a completely self-contained uh, critique, not just a painting, but also of like the expectation of something being real. I know that's super. It's us, we, it's us looking at it, thinking, oh, it's not milk, it's plaster, but it's actually paint. That kind of endless, that really endless cycling of via paint, oil paint, or acrylic, or in this case, oil paint, you know, it goes in cycles through all these kind of material guises of materialities, you know, that's something I love. And I also consciously, um, I consciously um, treat this as a topic, you know, like with the alcohol or when I mimic uh, plaster, you know, uh, plaster work on walls or right. I have the droplets, uh, the stuff coming out of the tube. It's always sort of um, mimicking an other material. Yes. Yeah. So I, I mean, and this is a, actually a very kind of idiosyncratic, atypical Ruscha. I'm not that familiar with all of what he did in 65, but it, it seemed to be the one image that really um, spoke to how you use, you know, that, that vertiginous symmetry of uh, illusionism, um, illusionism against itself, painting against the expectations of what a painting could be, um, all of those things. Uh, I, I wonder uh, if we can go to the painting with the red and blue uh, uh, droplet. Uh, I think it's a, it's a tree painting, yeah. So, so this, this painting to me, there's a direct correlation, you know, between your use of this, this red and, and blue droplet and the, the plaster milk. Yeah, right, right. This, this, this idea with the droplets, uh, droplets is derived from a, 
work that I did before, and I showed an ex which I showed an exhibition in eighteen in Berlin called the Einholung, which has varied meanings. Difficult, and it's also um, a kind of invented word. Um, doesn't really exist. Anyway, in this in this show, there were on the one hand sort of monochrome yellow paintings that were all fixed to the wall with various handmade metal devices, like secured. Yes. On the other hand, large format paintings, um, you know, with sort of pigment washes and the what and the pigments were either mineral or metal. That wasn't articulated in the title. It's just something I was doing, and they incorporated droplets. They were a little smaller than this, and it looked like kind of decor, it had the aspect of decor and uh, stucco, no? The plaster stucco work, and it would be um, integrated color-wise. So it would be stuck on and then painted over and there would be this flat painting with these washes and then these droplets coming out. You didn't know, is it supposed to be paint or is it tears or is it sweat or whatever? And from there comes these, from there, from before come these, uh, these, these droplets come through. And they're quite fat. I mean, these are quite a opulent droplet. And I remember wondering, should I leave it white or not? And then not. And also the other ones, they're all matte and this one has oil paint on it. So it's a shiny, in a way, not vulgar, but it's very much to the fore. Yeah, to me, you know, it looked, it looked like a fishing lure, like does, yeah. just like the lure of like the illusion of the plaster milk uh, for the bird. And, uh, you know, it's, when I was thinking about LA, I was kind of like ranging around and uh, there's this great quote by Nathaniel West who is, you know, the, the, liter the liter literary avatar of like, you know, LA in, in Hollywood in the 30s. And he says, only those who still have hope can benefit from tears. <laughs> yeah, I, well. You know, that's probably a stretch, but I think I think there's a relationship between like that quote and the expectation of, you know, the suspension of disbelief that the viewer brings to the painting, to a painting that the artist is always kind of dealing with. But if we can look at one of the alcohol paintings, maybe the one where one of the bottles is lying on, is already tilted and it's, uh, the alcohol is coming out, it's leaking. Yeah, exactly. So in this painting, say, suspension of disbelief, because of the willingness of this yeah, activity, uh, for instance, the way that uh, Schnapp's bottle on the left, Himbeer guys, whatever it is, is painted, uh, it is supposed to be so seductive, seen from an alcoholic's point of view, but also see from a painter's audience, painting's audience point of view. So this, it's like double seduction, you know, Oh, how delicious, I'm so thirsty, but also how beautiful my eyes are gonna look at this beautiful glass bottle. Right. And because of this seduction, you know, uh, you, are tot you are completely uh, addressed in another manner than let's say through the background or through those marks at the top of the hand. So it's there, there. these fingerprints on the, the top, they will point to a body. I'm not thinking about this when I do it, but I know it any, so, and somehow anyway, or I observe it in retrospect. But seeing those finger marks, you know, somebody did it. Somebody went and did it. Also it points to the body, but you are dressed differently with the bottle. You're willingly, willingly going to go and be seduced in a way, you know, so. Yeah, and I love how those finger marks look like claw marks. <laughs> you know, like it's, there's kind of like something, I mean, you know, I, I mean, just, I, I connected in my, in my head with kind of a desperation, alcoholic desperation, but, but also, yeah. I think there's also the, the available cheap transcendence of intoxication, right? Yes, we did mention that, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, there's like a cheap transcendence with uh, intoxication that um, it's available, right? It's available on, you know, across, what do they say with drugs, like over the counter. It's like an over the counter transcendence, right? A availability is key, yeah? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they, they occupy a place that is again it's like the it's the entry point of the painting the, the, the threshold the proscenium as you've said before how you stage your work I know going way back you did a, a, a series of paintings of a puppet a Mozart puppet show and it was literally a stage like a puppet show stage but it seems like you you maintain that staging throughout the different series that you work yes. you work 
I think so too, and specifically here with the alcohol bottle paintings, I thought of those old paintings of the uh, Rococo Marionette Theater because they also the way they stand down there at the, at the bottom edge of the painting. Yes. You know, figures. Yeah, I thought of that. It's just like, you know, 10 green bottles standing on a wall or, yeah, I thought of that too. I do that. And so I think that even still, I notice that gravity is in operation in, on yeah. the illusional level in the paintings, even with the matchsticks, you know? So what are they doing? They're hovering. Yes. Or they're floating or stuff is falling. So in this sort of stage, stage, the sphere of staging, the things that happen are always sort of minor. Things swing to and fro or something may fall or a tree sheds its bark and that's sort of the most, activ most activity you'll get. And all the staging is there for this, apparently for this small movement or change to uh, occur. But gravity is the up and down and right and left and gravity is always an operation. And I find uh, mostly not always, but mostly the um, uh, the edges of the painting, the utmost activated zones. Yes. So, um, and this maybe not so much, but in many paintings, as, um, I'll work specifically towards the edges. And what is the what's the translation of this title, uh, Monica? Oh, it's just uh, just the it's very banal. It's just um, the river Rhine at the river. So it's okay. That's really very literal. <clears throat> so you know, I was doing some. I was I was doing some etymology myself and I, I you know I was looking at the word for matchstick in German and it's Streichholz, Holtz? Streichholz, yeah. But but there's also a, 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 a slang term for pun or or actually prank it's, which is strike in German too. I saw I never thought of that I never thought of that. Yeah so I was I, thinking I was thinking wow you know that's so cool. It's the, the wordplay it directly maps on top of the actual thing. I never would have thought of that, but that Streich means stroke. So you strike match, it's a stroke. Right. Streich is the stroke, but Streichellen is two strokes. So it's very similar, like in English, yeah? Yes, and, and, uh, and match is also like a soccer match, but there, there's also, I think, I think a soccer match can be called a strike as well. I'm not sure, but uh, there are these levels of, of wordplay that are, are embedded and inherent to the use of the match. Obviously also there's the incipient foyer, you know, of the match, incipient, um, another, another kind of threshold that the, the incipience of like what would happen when that's struck, right? What does incipience mean? Sorry, I don't know the word you know, uh, about to happen. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. Well, I, I tested burnt match, but no, I tested that. Uh -uh. <clears throat> yeah, there would be, yeah, be kind of like, that wouldn't actually, yeah, no, I know, I, I can understand why you wouldn't use a burnt match. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> deflated then, no? Right, well, it would have been a fait accompli, right? And, and there's nothing, nothing to, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no, nothing to wait for. I have a question because uh, I, th this was pointed out to me in the review that was in the Brooklyn Rail. And I was thinking about the fact that um, I used to, like right from the beginning when I left uh, the Academy in Dusseldorf, um, say with the Mozart series or the series of mar marionette paintings, they were only four painted over the period of two years. So usually if I'm doing uh, developing new work or new paintings, it'll take about two years. And so for this show, I worked for three years. So three years went to this exhibition. And formerly it used to be like one set of paintings. And then the next group showed again, maybe an exhibition would be something totally other, right? And that changed then after a while, over years, it changed to this happening more or less simultaneously. Like here, there are the tree paintings. I painted them for maybe two years always the same, always these tree paintings, seriously, I mean, and then the matchstick paintings came in and usually the second set or the second group is the more playful zone or region where the tension from the one, this fixation can sort of spread out and gather some kind of refresh, get refreshed and then swing back again, you know? So there's this kind of interplay between these groups. In this case that came into one exhibition 
And as I got the critique that maybe the tension, this kind of dialectical method or the kind of, you know, using this, uh, believing in this kind of dialectical approach would then um, become more, become, uh, have less and less tension over time. I was wondering, does it make, a, what difference would it make if there were only one set of paintings in a show and not two? Right. Well, you know, I, I think that's a really interesting question. I, I don't necessarily agree with the critique. Mm -hmm. um, why, but anyway. Yeah, but maybe it has something to do with like what you were saying before about, yeah, you know, that's already been kind of decided like, you know, years ago. But I, I, I think it's still in play. Um, for, for, and, you know, and, and some, another interview, I, I, I recall you talking about Maybe, maybe this would be a good point to introduce how you think about your process, like the, the beginning of your process, because in an interview that I, I think it was from the Hammer Museum, you discussed starting, you know, like starting in the studio and how you, you created an energy in the studio, uh, a rhythmic energy, a back and forth, a moving through the space. And that, in that, and also traveling too. Like you would travel to take, um, you know, a, a trip to the Black Forest to do drawings that would be incorporated, but you didn't necessarily know how they would be incorporated until you took that trip. So there's there's both kind of like a encanting of a certain energy in the studio, but then there's a a, a kind of a leap of faith to take these trips that you don't necessarily know how they're going to wind up. And I think that's really important, I think, for us to talk about, because I think that it also leavens the idea of a quick irony or just like a, a simple wit. Well, I can answer that, but it's, it's more like two topics. The one topic is, you know, the, you know, walking to and fro in the studio and the kind of rhythmic aspect. That is something I thought about as an answer to um, Isabel Graf's um, description of how painters seem to believe that the painting is alive. Right. This somehow takes up the status of a quasi subject. Right. My answer to that would be or was that I personally, or in my case, or the way I see it, I don't believe it that painters think their paintings are alive but they go make a big effort or complicated maneuvers to create a situation where the dynamics of a kind of relationship can even occur so it's a complicated i don't even say it's planned but it's a complicated charging of a, of a space on a situation to make this dialogical relationship even possible because what you do with a thing on the wall that's white i mean why would you go and worry about it or be frustrated by it, for instance, you know? So this is all this pre-activity, which I describe as rhythmic. You, you walk there, you walk back, you walk there, you walk back. Mm. You leave, you come back, you drink something, you don't. You know what I mean? There's kind of repetition, repetition, repetition. Not, I'm not saying it's hyp 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 hypnotical, but there is some as a quality, there can be a quality to it. So that was one thing I was talking about. And the other about starting, so I'd say in all of the work from a certain time on, like early on from after my studies, there's this basic decision that I'll do whatever painting wise work with, I'll do whatever suggests itself strongly enough, whatever it is. That's a decision I've made and that's what I do. So mm. I, don't, I don't plan, oh yeah, I think a really good idea of paint matchsticks or hmm, maybe now, you know, it's not like that, it isn't planned. It suggests itself and I have to be sort of alert and then I'll go through with it. And it can be also embarrassing. So for instance, the tree paintings, when this turned up, I thought there would be figures going through the painting or faces, and then only one survived in the very first painting. There's one drawing of a face in that painting. Maybe we can see it. It's the first um, slide of a tree painting with a white droplet. There, they're up there, exactly. So there's a white droplet on the left. On the right, there's this face, right? You see that drawing of the silhouette, the profile. Yeah. So there, this, this still survived from, the, uh, from what I thought was going to be, the paintings were going to be beforehand. So that's just the survivor of that. And then that was gone. And I thought, oh, no, please don't let me start doing landscape paintings. 
least not landscape paintings. So I wouldn't know beforehand what this is supposed to be, you know, and I have to sort of concentrate on what the elements of this set seem to be. And it then turns out to work, 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 work. Oh, it's actually only that strip of foreground. It's only the wall and it's the tree. And then the, the, um, the sky as a protagonist in itself. That's it, that's all. And, and this uh, weird peeling of bark, that's right. all. And it takes a, a long time to find out. It's like a painting that has to be found, right? So it's, 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 it's suggests itself and I don't know what it is. And that makes it really difficult to work because it's, I know it's specific and I haven't a clue what it is. So I have to get there. Right. And, and the other way, the other way around, the matchstick paintings or the black alcohol paintings or whatever they, they often are, these are paintings where I don't have a, a sense of it's there already. I don't know what it is and I don't know how to find it. It's more like I can play and find out and, and try out things. And it's much more open, you know, and it isn't a, it isn't like something that's there already. And I don't know, I can't see it yet. So it's a real and, difference. And this show is entitled On Hold, which is interesting too. And I think the term that you use in a previous interview is these things are, are in the term that you use is an interzone. Oh, for these paintings, yes, for these black ones, yeah. And so these elements are retained in an interzone until they're ready to be used, just for like painting, for a real painting, yeah. Right. And I think that's a really interesting thing for to talk about uh, in relation to what might be considered like an over weaning like impulse towards irony, which I think maybe Dan Cameron was talking about in the review. Mm -hmm. um, this, the, the idea that you're, you're somehow suspending, you know, the elements in an interzone until they're ready to be used implies a presentness in the process that isn't, uh, you know, it's not predictable. And, um, yeah. I don't, so, I, don't, I don't understand exactly what you're just saying. Well, you know, there, if you're, if you're maintaining these, these, there's, there's a quote by Edward Shea, he says, I, I used a, a waste retrieval method of working. I'll go back and use something that disgusted me 15 years ago, but that I had enough sense to think about. Some artists change dramatically. I see my work more like a history being written. <clears throat> so you, you develop this archive, uh, maybe intuitively, maybe, you know, um, in, an, in a chance aleatory kind of way. And, and then they come up for use almost like your history in later paintings. Yeah. So you own them, you own, you pre-own them in a way. Uh, <clears throat> so you're not necessarily, what I guess the point I'm getting at is that you're not necessarily predicting uh, an irony. No, I'm not. But for instance, in this case, I was working on the I was working on the other alcohol paintings with the big bottles and I was using stencils for the labels of the bottles. So I would have a photograph of the bottle, photocopy, I would cut out the label, make a stencil, use it on the black painting. Uh, on, yeah, use it on those paintings, let's say the Campari, whatever it is. So I had all these stencils lying around and then, and also I always have bits and pieces of stuff, stuff that I want to try out on a painting on the wall. And then I just wanted a place to have them like on a park deck or something where they would wait in this space, you know, as though they were collected there or gathering there before they're getting their cue for an appearance again, you know, like actors behind the scene or something, yeah? Yes, yeah, yeah, no, I, I just think that elucidating that process of yours is fascinating. I, I think that really informs the paintings. Uh, it really informs your process, it really informs the radical aspect of the work, I think. I think. The, what, what do you find radical? What would you would you say is a radical, a radical aspect? Well, I mean, maybe maybe risk risk taking in, in terms of you know the chance, the aleatory uh, <clears throat> accessing of these you know the these things that come to you through a, a certain kind of like process. It's a logical process, and then they they get <clears throat> stored in an inner zone maybe logical, maybe illogical, and they, they just, they come up when they seem right. <clears throat> uh, yes, and some, sometimes I'm really grateful if, if I like, if they sort of conf 
if they're more of my taste. Right. Uh, and sometimes, for instance, the alcohol topic also I had, a, I had reasons. I always have a reason to do something like that. Also, is also there's always a private biographical strain running through the work strongly. So there's always a kind of emotional or psychological or actual real life motivation to go into something or in the way things appear. That's for sure also with the alcohol. But I was also glad about the topic because it's a very fruitful topic. Whereas other, other topics I wasn't so happy about uh, and I still had to do them sort of, you know. <laughs> I'm, not, it's, it's, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna not do something because it isn't my taste, you know. Like for instance, I once did a set of vampire paintings, so-called vampire paintings. I was embarrassed, you know, it's like, ah, oh, no, shit. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll do it. And the tree is at the beginning too. I thought, I don't understand, you know, trees, a mm -hmm. tree. That was really for me very far-fetched, you know? No, I think there's a risk involved. I think that's what I meant by, I think that's, you know, radical. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, you're taking a lot of risks uh, with these. Um, you know why, you know why I made, I remember when I thought about this, for instance, vampires, the vampires I was painting when I was invited to documenta, so I knew, oh, okay, so I'm gonna show them. I knew that was a very uncool thing to do. <laughs> I mean, thank God I also had some money paintings, but still. <laughs> the reason not to not do that was to, um, if I break that, I have to then um, replace this method by a more strategic method, by strategy. Yes. And if I start being strategic at one point and not at another, then I lose my, I was fearing I would lose my cap capacity to locate myself. Right. And if I, if I follow this, which, I've, which I do, I know, that I know why I'm doing it. It may be a bad idea or <laughs> fail or be whatever, many things, but it's a clear, it's a, it's a clear following through for me, you know. <laughs> I love that. I love that term. The reason not to not do that. <laughs> I repeat that's that. like that's like that's that's so, so great. You can you can put that over your threshold or something. Uh, well, better not. I'll stumble every single time. No. Of your studio, right? Uh, but you know, we and we did in an earlier meeting. We talked about the idea of performative failure. I mean, I when I looked at the the liquor paintings, I thought of um, you know the, the anti-heroic antics of like Kippenberger, uh, you know, yeah, like- we were, we were talking about performing weakness because um, I remember I was talking to somebody about the work of Michel Kreber, you know, ages ago and about male heritage lines. So we're talking about Germany, um, you know, and in Germany there's this, it's different than in America, but in Germany there's this, a stronger male heritage line concerning painting. I mean, in, in America, you have also female painters. Right. Um, that, I mean, you have anyway, but they're prominent, you know, um, acknowledged uh, on the one hand. And also there's the very strong nationalistic uh, charge to it too. So what do you do? What do you do if you are male and you are in Germany and you are there and there and you, so you find yourself sheer from, by definition in a heritage line. So how do you deal with that? And then we were talking about this work, also maybe Kippenberger, about then turning, yeah, de denying heroism, and denying, for instance, large formats, for instance, or denying what you call in the US a muscular stroke. Right, uh, it's anti-heroic, right? And do, I think we have an image of a, of a, a Kippenberger ready-made here somewhere. So this is called alcohol torture, you know, which is like, it's just so funny. I mean, his- I've never seen that before, but yeah, but sure. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, I love the fact that it's like, a, it's an addition to, you know. And Schlesser Alt, that's Düsseldorf, mm-hmm. Uh -huh. um, yeah, okay. well, I'm sure that wasn't, in, that wasn't an accident, you know, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that was intentional, uh, but- Maybe Torture refers to the Alt also, mm -hmm. But again, it's that anti-heroic gesture. It's the cheat transcendence. You know, it's as if the alcohol, is the alcohol doing the torturing or is it, is the alcohol like stuck in that ring, you know, like a, like a sea turtle, you know? No, uh, it's, it's uh, how do you say? Oh, handcuffs, right, mm -hmm. right. Yes, but uh -huh. this is something else because it's not taking place within painting and painting has this total other 
this is really just a you know a can. So right. it's not working against the tr tradition that painting in itself brings along with itself, you know. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's a, there's a quote by Kippenberger. He says, an artist who opposes him, himself still has the best chances to reach some result. So, you know, that's also, you know, it's interesting. I found that interesting because it's not just an anti-heroic stance. It's not just a reactionary stance. It's actually a stance of intention, you know? Yeah. If, yeah and, and so that seems to jive with your own. I mean, um, if you're not necessarily opposing the, the her well, on some level, you're opposing the heroics of painting as an inherited tradition, male tradition, um, but you're also trying to reach some results. It's you can't really compare it because I'm not I'm a part of the male uh, heritage line, um, you know, so that's a big difference. And I remember when I, I painted a series of paintings or a series, three or four big paintings, incorporated ashes and slices of sausage to so meat cuts, cold cuts and coins and even some money bills. Uh, and I was at that moment thinking, oh wow, this is gonna be a real sort of polka format. Before that I only had sort of cinemascope three meter wide horizontal formats. So it was a thing, yeah, this format, by now it isn't a thing anymore, but it was then. But I was thinking, you know, about mm, performing weakness as a woman, you know, in German one says, das schwache Geschlecht, which means the weak gender, that's what a woman is, the weak, that's a traditional way of naming it, right? You don't say that in English, do you? There, there's true. something, yeah, the, the, the weaker sex, yeah, sure. Well, there you go, the weaker sex. Why would the weaker sex perform weakness, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you see there's the difference, you know, so. Yes, yeah, of course, no, I, I know. I, I, I wasn't trying to make a, a direct correspondence, but, uh, no. um, but you know, there is, there is something very maudlin and theatrical about Kippenberger uh, that um, you play with, not you don't play with the maudlin because that's not an aspect of the anti-heroics, but you, you do, the, the, there's something very theatrical about his work, I think that, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. so why don't we go back to uh, the, the images from the show, Lewis? Uh, can we go through the images, uh, like the next one? Uh, maybe the next one. Uh, next. Uh, maybe some close-ups. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, let's, let's go to the Loose Change, because that's the title of the show. And there's these, these watercolors. <clears throat> I think they're watercolors, right? Or are they acrylics? They're watercolors. Okay. Again, you know, with the watercolors, I couldn't help but think of, you know, Goethe's watercolors or the whole idea of like the romantic relationship to watercolors. Um, it's just an association that I, I, I came, came with, you know. But then I don't know if we have a close up, but dispersed between the water watercolor gestures are these. Uh, loose, literally loose change, like nickels and dimes, right? Can we see another one too? Uh, another uh, one of these works on paper, maybe with a saw, or, or for instance, that one, yeah. <clears throat> There's one, or one more. Yeah, okay. So these watercolors I've been doing since 2017 or so, just um, not knowing what or why, but going on and on with it, not knowing what it was going to lead to. But um, for, for me, clear was that each of these blobs, like red color or orange watercolor blob or gray, whatever you want, uh, has its, takes the position of a thing. So it's a thingness, it's, it's a thing in itself. It, it's not descriptive or anything, you know? And it's also because of its thingness, and it's chargedness, A, being watercolor, being in a painting, being in the logic of painting, being on a paper, you know, being art, um, it becoming a currency in itself, you know. Uh, and then, and then and you I, have a broken saw blade in there too. Well, that does appear, yes, but only twice. <laughs> um, but yeah, that comes from somewhere else. I can describe where it comes from. 
sure. like, contradictory. This saw blade, so their saw blades, I, wait a minute. This, using a saw blade uh, or a piece of metal in this, in these works comes from these monochrome yellow paintings who, that were all, had these like accessories, these metal accessories that were chrome. So they were aluminium fixtures, hardware, which was made for the painting small and chrome, a bit like jewelry. And it, it posed a security device, a securing device. And then, so I had later on, I had saw blades sawn through. So I had fragmented saw blades and they were chromed. So this one isn't chrome, but there's another one in this set of uh, paper works, which is chrome. So this, this, this money coin chromed metal um, associations. And also I wanted, um, I was, the saw blades were taken away. They're only in the works on paper, but they're nowhere near the trees. So I knew there was this, I'd say a very stupid, really clumsy uh, connection between saw blades and trees, not to mention matchsticks. Anyway, so that's why they're very separate. <clears throat> and I can't help but think of the pun too of saw, you know, see and saw. Uh, a broken sea, a broken saw, right? I, I mean, I saw that and it's broken. Uh, or it's, you know, the, again, you know, the expectation of what an image is supposed to impart. Also here with the insult, I mean, this is again, a little clumsy title, insult to the eye, because there's so many coins, it's dirty. It's sort of sullying the supposed elevatedness of a delicate watercolor. Yeah, and of course, so, you know, in the context of like bl blockchain and, and uh, you know, all, all those virtual <clears throat> uh, currencies, it, it becomes a, a bit nostalgic. And uh, I remember like, you know, if, if you were walking around New York City, a panhandler would ask you for loose change, you know? A panhandler, does that mean somebody begging? Yes, yeah, so, you, you know, people would literally have loose, loose change more often in their, in their pocket, you know, before using plastic for everything. But it, it, it does have an abject, it has a bit of an abject um, association. Well, I have, a, I have a really long interest in this idea of loose change. I've had little pink spiderweb paintings with matchsticks and coins and even keys in, in the paint, so like, immersed in the paint. And it's something I'm interested in because it's, it, I have this image, you know, of a, uh, you know, trousers with a pocket, like a suit, like a male suit trousers, how do you say? Yeah. And all the tingling and everything and the, the proximity to the genitals and all that. I mean, male or whatever, I don't care, but this sort of <laughs> hand in your pocket, all this stuff that you're jingling around, you in the hotel room, you put it onto the bedside table. So all this stuff that you would have in a pocket, that's and also the cigarettes and the light and all this stuff, I find somehow erotic and charged and interesting on the one hand, and on the other hand here with the saw and the coins and uh, mm, this question, I was thinking about it too, do you have loose change or small change? Is that when you have so much, if that's what you have in, a pocket, in your pockets, and nowadays for sure, these few coins, then you say in German, da geht mir das Messer in der Tasche auf. In German that means I get so angry also frustrated, the knife opens in my pocket. And that's uh, something also I was thinking of with this, oh, so that's what I have in my pocket, a saw, you know, a little rusty saw. So it has all these spiel in it. Right, and, and the German word for loose, loose uh, small change is Kleingeld, right? Yeah. So it's like little little change, little money. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so little money is not as important as big money. Um, but, you know, it's also like, like I said, you know, uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago would be phenomenal reality in people's pockets, you know, often making holes in your pockets, ironically, because uh, you have that stuff that that iron, you know, carrying that iron around in your pockets and like the, the metaphor of the knife opening up in your pocket. Uh, but, you know, I, I definitely couldn't help but seeing the visual pun here with the seesaw. It reminded me of Joyce, you know, and uh, you mentioned that you were half Irish, which I found interesting in terms of the wordplay. In terms of like a Joycean wordplay and, and very serious relationship to punning. There's also, I mean, this is something again, 
I'm glad to I'm glad to affix the word change to the coins and not to the tree stumps. Yes. But I knew that also there there was the you know it's like getting rid of clothes that are too big or something the way that bark is being thrown off or peeling off or so. Right. Yeah, and it's it's for me the the bark sh the shedding it's a process of growth it's a process of uh, um, of becoming you know and and. A, a being becoming. It's a metaphor for being becoming. I don't know. I mean, if it's very, very symbolic. I know that. And I also had this, you know, notion of, oh, the paintings. I had such a tough time with the paintings. With, with two of them, a really hard time. Uh, like months and months and months of working on these paintings. And I was wondering, are they the bark, you know? <laughs> Is that what they are as well? Especially the one, so four of those tree paintings were painted in Los Angeles and the fifth is in Berlin. And the one in Berlin is the one where the wall goes right up to the top where the wall is, hasn't got a surface on which things are lying. Let me see that it's number, not 11, 12, number, stop. It's, it's number 14. 14, 14. That I painted ages on that painting and it nearly drove me crazy. It's funny because it's the most simple looking, you know. I know, I know it was difficult for me. I think also because I took, so I took more and more out of the painting. There was bark flying around everywhere. And there was, as in all of the other paintings, there was also this stage-like ledge that that wall has usually on which right. stuff is lying. So I had that for months. I was arranging stuff on that ledge and how deep is it and how light is it? And in the end I gave it up. And giving up that ledge made this painting just possible. You know, before that would never worked sure. because now it's like three elements in the back the backdrop. Right. And before the, the ledge was always this diffuse fourth element that was sort of in some vague way active. So that was a difficult painting. Also, there's not much left on that tree either. Yeah, the ledge, the ledge in this one really looks just like another painting. Like it doesn't look like an illustrative ledge. No. It looks like a transition, you know. I was hoping it would still pass for a wall, but yeah, I know what you mean. But anyway, so maybe let's say in reality, uh, I don't know, nine centimeters ledge is gone, yeah? So that was a difficult painting to paint for me. This painting for me, you know, another expatriate in LA, uh, David Hockney. Yeah. It reminded, it reminded me of, uh, you know, how David Hockney would also use the illustrative impulse and then, you know, and, and make, make his own version of cubism. But the subject ostensibly was like, you know, LA and, uh, in some in some ways he <clears throat> he was in, similar to Rouche in the sub, the subject of palm trees in both of those artists come even though these are the eucalyptus it comes up but the graphic nature of this really made me think of the simplicity of his his illustrative style when he spent the time in L.A. Hockney yeah. Uh, also, something that was also crossing my mind, which I find very interesting, are these Ed Rocher paintings of ledges, and they're all slanted, and there's like broken tire bits and stuff on top, and they remind me of Gaston's ledges and walls. Do you know which ones I meant? Mean? Yes, I do. Can, we can't have an image now because it's spontaneous, right? Or somebody can quickly fish, fish something out. <clears throat> we we have one image of a uh, 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 Rocher a miracle painting. The miracle is, is beautiful. That's, yeah, but... I, I like that. it's beautiful. And this is in, I think, uh, this is in the tape. Um, but could we, could somebody find an image of the, it was like a Gaussian in Beverly Hills or something in 2.15 or so? And there are these ledges, so there's an accumulation of stuff, sort of garbagey stuff lying on a ledge. Also this, yeah, like Morandi or like some Gaston painting. Yes. Right, like a still life, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I included this because it, the, there's a certain slanting uh, gesture in the, in the tree, tree paintings that this reminded me of. And you know that's what, that what happens when that's what happens when the tree finally falls, yeah? Right, it's a miracle. Then the light shines up. Right. But you know, again, you know with, with, with Ruche, it's, it's, never, it's never what it is at face value. I mean, I think he was. I think he was brought up Catholic as well. So this idea of a miracle, uh, but a depicted miracle, is it's almost like uh, a, a little taboo. It's like you know, you're not supposed to see that, or it's it's not it's not 
It is the Catholic tradition there, for sure. It's not depictable, you know. Uh, uh, the other tradition is, it because it's depicted, it's proven. Like the doubting Thomas, where the finger goes into this vaginal wound. Right, yeah, no, le no leave me turned there, right. No, 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 not that one. Where uh, Thomas has this wound and, no, Christ has this wound. Right. And Thomas put his finger into it. In right. the blood, is a Caravaggio painting and this proves to us that it really is true. This proves yeah. that it's a miracle really did happen. Look, there it is. <laughs> right, and I, I mean, I, I kind of personally identify that with that because of my name, but but <laughs> that goes back to the idea of skepticism, right? That, yeah. you know, the idea that, you know, you, there's a certain play of skepticism with any image and there's, there's a suspension of disbelief until it can be touched, but sometimes it can never be touched. You know, it, it, it never gets touched. But maybe uh, there's always an aspect, maybe, I don't know, this is a theory, I'm just chucking this out, but maybe there's always an aspect of the desire to persuade. So persuasion uh, in a painting or in, I don't know, in a painting, I'm just talking about, just talking about paintings right now. So even if somebody is very, seems to be detached, I don't know what, there's still this aspect of persuasion <clears throat> once something is sort of manifest, you know? Well, it demands a certain yeah. it demands a certain faith on the viewer, you know, which translated in modernism is like you know the the, the image interrogating the viewer, but it's also like uh, Kierkegaard's Night of Faith versus the Night of Infinite Resignation. So, like, I think you know, in the postmodern era, it's we're all like the Night of Infinite Resignation rather than the Night of Faith. You say, uh, you know, th there's not like. Anyway, yeah, so I don't want to get off on that, but. Um, Maybe not. Uh, so where were we? <laughs> um, I was trying to, I was trying to uh, push the, um, the Edrichet ledge to the fore. Oh yes, yeah, I, I don't know if we can retrieve well, that, but. Doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Let's look at that, let's look at that beautiful Jasper Johns that you have there in your slide collection. <laughs> Yeah, so, so this is, it's ter not a great slide, uh, so I apologize for the, um, the quality of that, but this is a, an unusual Johns I hadn't seen before. It's in a private collection to uh, circa 65, 67. I, I chose it because, of, you know, his, his use of the spectrum is kind of a ready-made, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, so I, I chose it to kind of, uh, underscore our discussion of the spectrum. But the way he uses the spectrum on the left is very similar to those little tiny fragments in your on hold series that you use. It's, it's used as a decoy, you know, another title of one of his uh, paintings. It's used as according to what. Yeah. Um, these are all, you know, suggestive titles to suggest that, you know, John, John's was, aware of the presentation of like the fragment of the spectrum as um, a kind of a ready-made universal or a ready-made um, <clears throat> phenomenology. Um, but then, you know, again, I, I, I think you, I, I know that, <clears throat> I think in one of your catalogs, maybe it was John Miller who makes a reference to uh, John's, you know, okay. and, and a few people make a reference to John's in your work because of the, the objects, you know, uh, in relation to the painting. Um, I don't see a direct correlation between your very, work. Very, it was very, very interesting for me to read this in John Miller's text because it was something that had never occurred to me and I never knew much about Jasper John's work. Uh, I don't know why, I mean, maybe being in Germany and so, and I had, yeah, I didn't know it, didn't know it well, and also underestimated its brilliance. Let's put it that way. And also if I look at this here, yeah, so this piece on the left is supposed to be cut out on the right or something, yeah? Right. But it, but it doesn't fit, and also color-wise it doesn't fit. So even that already breaks open, you know, this space is broken. It just breaks out. It sort of opens up. You just, you just, you know, it's like leverage or something opens up this, I don't know what discursive space of it. No, it does not. It looks like, but it doesn't. So it's something different. So what's it doing? What's that relationship doing? And that's what I find exciting, for instance. I think, I think Miller makes the point too that uh, maybe when, you know, when Johns was painting like this, the public wasn't quite as used to reading an image as a text as we might be now. 
So the audience has changed in terms of their ability to read the image as a text. It's a point that John Miller makes in that catalog. I forget which, for which show that was, but... Uh, it wasn't for a show, it was just a, a, a catalog we put together at the time. Mm. But I think it's an important point to make because, you know, <clears throat> say relative to Dan Cameron's recent review, the fact that there's a shift in, in reading an image as a text more easily by say like the general population, you know, the so-called man on the street, person on the street. It, it does it does put your work in another context, I think, in a, in a contemporary context of, of reading the paintings. Yes, but I, I wouldn't be able to um, articulate further how. I know that it's a vocabulary and there's a semiotic aspect to it and that the vocabulary is I can't read, there's something I can't talk about. You don't have to, you make No, I'm not able to. It's not like it's secret that I know all about. I just, I'm not able to. I don't know, I don't know enough about it. Right. Um, I, well, I, you know, just suffice to say that he makes that point and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an apt point that he made for you. Yes. And, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for his work too, in terms of the hyper real his relationship to the hyperreal in his own work, and also the maudlin, there's an aspect of his work that contains maudlin aspects, kind of abject quality. Uh, so I think he was a good kind of interlocutor for your, he for, was reading, very for reading your work. Yeah, it was very interesting the way he was talking about um, the theatrical. Yes. Staging. So he was describing, I think as far as I remember the text, he was describing how on the one hand there was this kind of, hmm, notion of performance within the narration taking place within a painting, like say performative aspects, theatrical performative aspects, say the tree leaning to the left, oh, it's falling over or something, yeah? Or the staging of that little space, you know, with the wall. On the one hand, and on the other hand, there was um, a clear staging of, that's how he described it, of the painting as an object, you know, certainly in the various different kinds of monochrome paintings groups that I've done. Right where they have little images and there's a little bottle on the ledge or there's a key on top, whatever they're doing, or they're, they're, they're screwed to the wall so that nobody steals them because they're so desirable and all that, you know? So there's always this performative aspect. It was interesting, very, very interesting for me, that text. Yeah, for me personally, like your work escapes in a kind of an easy um, code, you know, like encapsulization. Um, it, it escapes that, and I, I find that really intriguing. Thank you very much. I was also wondering about, for instance, in this exhibition, because I spent so much time with this work, like three years, um, it's sort of, there's, there are these three aspects in the show, the tree paintings, or with the title yet to be titled, then three of these matchstick paintings, and then the works on paper. So if I think of it, if I think about it afterwards, because it's, it comes about such in that manner. Um, I was worrying about, oh, I wish I could have other paintings than the tree paintings, but there aren't any, and I can't think of any, and there aren't any. And then sort of near the end, then this matchstick topic suddenly turns up, thank God, then it comes up and then I have this scope I can swing towards and then swing back again. You know, there's this range opening up. And for me, I can't imagine what it's like to see this work, maybe if you don't know it, and if you're not me, <laughs> but, it covers, it covers um, a region of concentration with main focus, let's say on the tree paintings and the very rigid, intense focus. And then kind of side, you know, what you see out of the corners of your eye is that maybe the works on paper and I don't know what they're doing, but it's sort of coming together. And then the, the matchstick paintings come up in a more playful light. It's much lighter also to make. It's concentrated, but it's easier to make it in the sense of light, light, lightheartedness or whatever, lighter. Right. So, so these paintings also are, this work is also covering uh, a scope of time spent. Right. There and there and shifts of, in, of focus and, you know, radiations of attention. And so that's also uh, for me important. I don't want to, I don't, until now, I don't want to, to have an exhibition of new paintings of one sort as if the paintings were the 
product right the result it's more yeah. like this weird dynamics that have dynamics that has the dynamics that have brought together this work after such a long time it, i find it a long time for me it was a long time i think you know, that's what i was trying to get at earlier i think that process is often invisible to the viewer you know but very very present to the artist uh, that that long gestation period that long period of of you know consideration um so so the breadth of that i find breathtaking you know in your work i, I think the breadth of your your pre-consideration or your it being immersed in the process of consideration of these paintings it's fascinating to me thank you very much it's and it's, again it's not uh, um, i don't know what is that what pre-consideration means it's it's the matchstick paintings matchstick topic turns up by now i mean when i was younger i used to be really terrified i mean i still am to be honest which is horrible, but it's true. But I used to be scared um, of the work because I, it looked so bad at the beginning, in the middle, and so on. It looked a long time really bad. That also here. So the paintings look really, really awful for quite a long time. And because I'm more experienced, I thought when I was younger, I would lose faith earlier and I would give up or start a new painting, it would be endless. Right. So, it isn't planned enough to give me the reassurance that it'll be okay. Yes. It's like it's gonna sort of, I hope, just sort of hope, yeah. Right, right. Maybe, no, I, I, I maybe totally. This sound, maybe this sounds vain or coy because. I don't think you know, so. I, I don't, I mean, I don't think it sounds, to me, it sounds realistic. I'm a painter myself. It just sounds totally realistic, you know. Good, I'm glad. It sounds pragmatic and realistic. Um, we can let the critics uh, decide whether it's romantic and, you know, a, a pathetic projection. Uh, well, it's an effect, a very effective pathetic projection that fits to my life very nicely. <laughs> well, I, I think... full of projections, to be accurate. I, I, think that the, I think that's a wonderful place to, um, to kind of wrap this up. And it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm not going away, but I think it's probably about time for us to go to um, questions and answers from, from everybody who is participating online. Yes, thank you, thank you, Monica. Thank you, Tom, 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 thank you very much. Wonderful, um, thank you both. Pleasure. This has been such a generous conversation. Um, our first question uh, comes from Lynn Crawford. Lynn, you should be able to unmute. Thank you. Um, this was so fascinating. Um, and Tom used the word decoy, which kind of helps me with this question. Uh -huh. Because I was looking at your work and um, the parts that were, whether you want to use the word muted or less defined, or um, to me, they were an invitation to spend more time looking there. And the, the smaller, very clearly defined objects were almost like a distraction. That's interesting. Thank you. you know, and your I wanted to go there, but really, <laughs> what was really the important part was the less clear, seductive part. And I so wish I could see them, and I'm sure I will someday in person. But could could you talk about that a little bit? Do you remember which painting you were looking at where you noticed this? Well, pretty much all of them. I mean, every time I saw the, I think initially there were several paintings that um, had, you know, sort of smoky, almost atmospheric, foggy yeah. um, things. And you could see like a, a slight outline perhaps. I mean, I'm looking on a computer, so. Yeah, yeah. But but it was, but then there were these, your, my eye went to like the clear, small, um, portrayed thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And Tom used the word decoy, which is perfect because it made me feel like, okay, these, these things are there, they're visible. You can look at them, but what's really going on, you're going to have to spend more time with, and you're going to have to go away from the less seductive thing and enter into this foggy. Less I what you're saying. It sounds like you're describing that when something is accurately depicted as an object, you um 
it is you're looking at a let's say you're looking at something a description of something whereas in this foggy what you call these foggy parts and you're looking at yeah. you're looking at a certain painterly qualities or particles that are not describing anything but sort of uh, stand for themselves let's say it's particles you're looking at these particles and they that's it you know what i mean you're looking at something actual and not descriptive yeah and there may be something there mm -hmm. if you're looking at it with the right glasses or if, or the right amount of time or whatever mm -hmm. you're bringing to it that was that's what fascinated me um it's well, thank you very much for this observation okay <laughs> thank you lynn my pleasure <laughs> yeah Next up, we have a question or also a comment from Olivia Mole. Olivia ah. should be able to unmute. I'm going to. Olivia. Hi, Monica. Hello, Olivia. Good to see you. How... Yeah, you too. This was so great. And hi, Tom. Um, I don't really have a question. I just I put a, a thing. It was just a, a response to what to like a bunch of the things that you were saying, but um, uh, it was, I, it's also because I've been thinking about this separately, but the idea of the Kleinerman and the fall, um, these like the swerve of atoms, which was again, like Tom bringing up James Joyce and the swerve of the river and Finnegan's Wake and these, someone else just brought up Beckett in the chat and these, these ideas of things that are, that there's this, this kind of, whether it's the void or, or chaos or like, uh, ineffable kind of substance uh, out of which things emerge but in specifically in these in this set of paintings it's they're emerging with gravity and this kind of this com kind of falling into being um as yeah. these as these objects kind of become and that so this the paintings are like this threshold of becoming um and then with the the tree that kind of rises back back out of that and sort of um, like dramatically explodes itself um, and then like with the matches and the trees and California and it's so it's already these things which are kind of already set up to to sort of explode or d destroy each other or be incendiary and then obviously you've got like the the red and the blue which has a kind of political <laughs> significance here and um uh, and so just this, and then the physical, the physical space of the painting with the objects like coming off the surface as well. Um, and then like, I've asked you before about the Catholic thing and the, and sort of likeness and presence and, the, um, and kind of objects and their representation. Um, but it's, what is it? when you would, huh? The, how do you say, substance sensation and embodiment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was, and just when you were talking about Doubting Thomas, I was like, and thinking about that, like, that, especially like the bulge, I was, I was actually able to see the paintings in person a couple of weeks ago. And the bulges okay. that really kind of come out of you, come out at, at you from the painting, um, I think because of, because of the color, it's, it's almost like when you were talking about Doubting Thomas just now, I was like, oh, we're the body. And that's like the fingers of the painting kind of pointing into our body space that out. Oh my God, I never thought of that. <laughs> but it's super interesting what you just said about the threshold of becoming, because that's something I think about you know, since a long time. Uh, and going back to what Tom was saying about language and reading a painting as writing, yeah. uh, you know, how if I, if I say, you know, like you say the page, I would say the, the painting as a stage, then certain elements, which I would then call a kind of visual vocabulary say, this is analysis and aftermath, nothing thought of beforehand. Makes it, so, they make, so these elements make their appearance, let it be a tree, I mean, let it be a matchstick or whatever it is, or a coin, a painted coin or whatever. And then these things, you know, they have their outfit, how do you say, they make their appearance and then they step back again and go back into circulation, okay. kind of turbulent circulation, and either they'll be they'll feed off somewhere else or they'll come back again, and then new things are added. So this kind of I even had that thought with the with the marionette theater paintings ages ago. There would be this kind of materialization, manifestation coming out of this fog, like vroom, there it is, and then it would dissolve again, right? So exactly yeah. how you describe it, the way you describe yeah. it. 
And then the Joyce thing, like the Joyce thing that Tom was bringing up, it's it's the set, and what you just described is like the Finnegan's Wake, the the last sentence of Finnegan's Wake being the beginning of the first sentence of the book, and it just and the, that kind of whatever it's swerve of riverbend or whatever, whatever the quote yeah, is. Yeah, it's like this. Yeah, yeah. It's this. There's also. I mean, sometimes I or I used to think sometimes there's a machinistic quality to it, like the workings of the work. <laughs> But there's also this kind of, uh, you know, accumulation, circulation, intensification, blah, 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 which for me is strongly in the matchstick paintings, which you can't see in the on the computer, but which I'm also working at still in the studio where it's about particles coming together and reacting. Yeah. yeah. Would you really feel, and so when you were describing that, like the actual kind of chemistry of the paint, or is it chemistry, whatever it is, the, like the physics, yeah. Yeah. particle, I don't know. What the stuff, the stuff. I don't know what, the physical property, property. And, what, and, and that like the color like the matches are so are so um kind of definitively rendered and also because of the color and also like the rendering against that soft against that soft background um is that you can almost like you can smell that smell of matches it's like matches are such a kind of a strong kind of chemical Thing yeah. as well yeah that you can that when you're talking like it seems sort of so appropriate to have them forming have this like incendiary device that forms out of chem out of the chemistry of the painting as That's well as true. as well as like the sort of representational aspects of it I have probably I probably have the vague I mean this is very banal and primitive but I probably have the vague expect expectation that the matches will light each other from sheer potential, you know. And not to mention the light up the tree as well. <laughs> no, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was really trying, I mean, again, this is like, oh no. Okay, first thing was, oh no, please not landscape paintings. God forbid, yeah. And the thing, then the next one was, oh no, not matchsticks made out of trees, no, no. So it's like, please not, but then, you know, I thought maybe it's possible, you know. First I thought, you know, it's too, too blunt to dumb i can't do this that the association the connotations are too clear but i think because it because in the paintings it gets more and more specific it's specific enough because of its specificity that it creates space between these obvious con you know associations clumping together yeah and it's like what the other person was saying is there are the things that are obvious things yeah. which then provide the kind of the decoy or like the first stop which is, and then there are the things beyond it, which are less tangible and, yeah. Something Not, I've, I, yeah. it just comes to my mind now that we're talking both in red, um, when, when Tom, when you were talking about <laughs> performing weakness, um, I remember thinking of these paintings still in Los Angeles, I wonder if they're too weak because they're, they have weak contrasts. They haven't got a lot of darkness or depth painted in them. You know what I mean? And so I was thinking, I remember, th thinking about their passivity, which is rare for me, usually that we're more assertive or more statement-like the painting. They have no, because they don't have depths painted into them, there's no real dark zones. Only one painting has a little bit of darkness. Uh, they have no, there's no history or uh, coming in of a developed secret or something weird like that. It's just like on top of the surface of the canvas, just as though the paint had just alighted there and could be blown off again, or, you know, it's just that top, it's just presenting that, that top layer without a kind of back um, body or history behind it. I don't know how to explain this, but it has to do with the way the color palette. And there's a weakness about that. There's a kind of lethargic, you can just pick it up. It's not going to defend itself. I don't know how to describe this, but there's this aspect I was going was going through my mind when I was painting, thinking, are they color wise strong enough? I wasn't sure, you know. I know they are, but that that counts for, as far as I understand it in the show, which I haven't seen, this weird lightness that's that's in that that's it then that seems to be in that space. At least that's what I can see in the photographs that people tell me. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Olivia, for all of those rich associations. Yes, as always. <laughs> and next up, I think we have a question from Charlie Schultz. Charlie, you should be able to unmute. 
Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Tom and Monica. It's been such a stimulating conversation to listen to. Um, and Monica, I have a kind of a basic question, but it comes from uh, like the profound observation that your paintings seem so fully arrived upon. And I, and I guess my question is, I, I'm curious how much of these, uh, the juxtapositions in the images um, are, are there from the outset? How much kind of develop in a, in a preparatory process? Um, if drawing is uh, largely related to your painting process or not? Um, yeah, just really thinking about- You're asking, arrived at, you mean, how do I arrive at that uh, iteration of that painting? Exactly, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I, I put specifically and say the matchsticks uh, is one that kind of is, is particularly surprising to me for the way that you've juxtaposed two, you know, radically different painting techniques. Is this uh, like, it, it, are there sketches that go into this process or, or is it kind of envisioned at the start and just rolled into it? Matchsticks are easier, much easier for me than the other ones because with the matchsticks, if I say, oh, matchsticks comes up again and again and again. So at a certain point, I'll listen to it. Okay, matchsticks. Then, I mean, they're not that big variations on the theme of matchsticks. So um, with the trees, it was much more difficult. With the matchsticks, um, I thought there'd be, I was hoping I would have a kind of surrounding for the matchsticks like in the works on paper. So there would be this color, blobs is the wrong word, but color zones. Uh, it didn't turn out that way, but I, that was what I was planning. So I think in the first painting, which is the red painting, I had that wash already. And then I drew, um, you know, maquettes, matchsticks with, you know, just pencil, color pencil on paper and cut them up in various sizes. When I had the size, I just, I thought about how they would move in space. So they're thought of as in space, you know, tilted up, you know, tilted into the painting or out of the painting, what the kind of lighting would be. Then I had them photographed. So I would have the drawing, I would have it in my mind, how it could look, then I would have them photographed. Then I would have the photograph enlarged, cut it up, stick it on the, painting, maker, um, what's the word, a stencil out of foil, painted in. Mm. That's how I put those matchsticks in there. Wow, that's a, that's a really interesting process, Monica. Yeah, that's the process for the matchstick paintings. Hmm. Well, that's super cool, thank you for sharing that. There you are, that was a technical step by step. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the question. Thank you, Charlie. Next up, we have Nick, our very own Nick Bennett from The Rail. Uh, Nick, you should be able to unmute. Um, thank you, Monica and Tom. I also, I have kind of a straightforward question. Um, Monica, I'm curious how teaching has affected your work and your approach to painting. Hmm. Good question, thank you. To think about it because I've been teaching so long but until now always as a guest so my first time I ever taught was also at Stedel School where Kristania invited me in. Um, usually it has the effect of being activating um, also makes me question my work more um, I find my principal question repeats itself. If I think of it, when I most often, if I would have a kind of statistics, my, the question I would ask out aloud or usually or to myself most often, looking at a work of a student would be, if it's a painting, it would be as what? So as what is this thing here? Hmm. Because it's standing for, it's, the painting stands in for a painting, but as what? So that's the kind of question I come, I'm sort of confronted with again and again, that's the question I ask. A, so what is it now? What's it doing? I ask that of my own work too. Uh, and B, I'm interested in the relationship of the person towards their work. So the quality of the relationship the quality of the re relationship towards the work, which always is very, very, very specific. Like everybody has this very specific quality of relationship, sort of relationship. It's like a relationship. 
it's an actually developed relationship. That kind of goes back to the question about rhythms and walking to and fro and charging the space. So that's actually also working on a, you'd say working on a relationship or not working on a relationship, but it has to do with that relationship. Mm. So those are the questions I'm actually really interested in teaching. Yeah, I would say mainly, and also, you know, concerning seeing also how things develop and how certain questions are dated. You know, I can put a, I can put a date on certain problems I have, like clearly stemming from the 80s, say, and it's different now. I mean, problems, some problems don't change, but others certainly do. Yeah, and it depends on where teaching. So teaching in the US, I've taught often at BART, MFA program, which for me is really informative and I learned very, a lot there. Specifically having studied in Germany and having living here, it's been really, really, you know, fruitful and exciting for me to be part of faculty at BART and also UCLA because it's different. It's a different system in the US. It's more team-based, different kind of relationship to the students. Whereas in Germany, you have a class, you know, I, I have a class, it's the Monica Bear class that people study in principle in theory with me for a few years. Maybe it's just one year, maybe it's five. It's a total other kind of setup and structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. It keeps me, it keeps, you know, it, as you all, probably for everybody, it keeps you more alert, no? And also it breaks the isolation. If you're stuck, I mean, you all know this, no? If you're stuck in your studio all the time alone painting, it's very good to get out. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Monica. I love that question of painting is what. Uh, I think our next question comes from Todd Lembry. Todd, you should be able to. Hi, Monica. Uh, thank you very much. This talk is great. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Um, so I had a question about how the bridge between two-dimensionality and three-dimensionality, I noticed in one of the paintings, it was one with the tree, the, there seemed to be, and it's very hard for me to see on the screen, but it seemed as if there was an object that stuck out from the painting. And I noticed in the materials list that either said high density foam or some kind of foam material. And I'm assuming that comprised that object that was there. So mm -hmm. then my question becomes, you know, I, I also work in painting and sculpture. And one of the taboos in sculpture is to, um, you know, utilize a material and then sometimes paint that surface because now paint is doing a job that paint doesn't normally, or the material of the sculpture itself is becoming something else. And I'm just curious how the role of paint in this piece changed for you between the two-dimensionality of the surface of the painting and the three-dimensionality of these objects that you choose to put in it? Or, or is that something that crosses your mind? It's something that weighs on my mind a lot. And I just wondered how you handled that in this. I mean, there's an automatic dimensionality to the object itself. And I feel like paint now has a different play almost. Is that, is that something that crosses your mind? Well, certainly, well, certainly not. Certainly, certainly. I've got an echo. Is the echo still on? No. Can you hear me? Yes. It's good okay. now. Okay, fine. So no, I don't pose the question the same way as you do. Certainly not. Also, I don't work in sculpture. Also, I don't have a, I would call it for myself uh, an essentialist in the sense of essential, the material, uh, essentialist approach to materials, except for when I am presenting them as themselves say in the titles, like I would say Fuchsite, or I'd say Malachite, or I'd say silver leaf, or I'd say whatever, cobalt. I would do it sometimes if it's in the foreground. So I would name the material depending on the role it plays in the painting or the specificity it has. Here, I'm creating the illusion of a tree behind a wall and I've got an actual droplet, which I've whittled out of hard foam and covered with a kind of uh, acrylic paste and I've sanded it and I've gestured it and I've put in this case, oil paint on it. In the other paintings where this has happened, I've mimicked, I've tried to create the illusion that this droplet is of the same material as its surrounding. It's just protruding, it's a decor, like a stucco. I said stucco, so it would be white or it would be camouflaged, there's only one painting with a white one. It would be camouflaged in the same color. Here in the one in the painting you mentioned with the blue and red, 
it's a clear clash. So it's difficult. Not only is it a clear clash color wise, because it doesn't connect color wise to the background, it's also oil paint shiny. So it's difficult. But because, okay, because it's um, in the same register of make believe, paint in the employed to take on a assist role play, let's put it that way. It doesn't matter if I'm painting a peeling off bark or I'm painting a droplet blue or red. And I don't worry about the tackiness of the material of the droplet, the rigid film. I mean, I take care that you just can't press it in with your fingers so it's hardened, but it doesn't matter that it's impure. Let's maybe impure is the wrong word. That it has this cheap um, stuffage quality. So no, I don't have the problem. And if I employ any kind of three-dimensional object in a painting or in, in connection with the painting, it's always in connection with the painting. So I the the uh, I never leave the painting far. I'm not going to have a parade in front of it or a car with a painting on top driving around city or something. It's going to be on the ledge of the painting or screwed onto the side or on top of it. So it's, so this kind of jump from two dimensions to three dimensions is gonna happen in the painting or at least on it or at it. it and, and it's also connection and it's a small, it's gonna be a small intervention. It's gonna connect uh, the plane of illusion, this kind of discursive field, which the painting is with the space that we're in, like that simple, but our space, like here it is the <laughs> coming out at us, or here it is, the yellow painting is actually fixed to the actual wall. So there's this connection from, yeah, model discourse to actual real space, but that's all it does. It's actually quite um, moderate and very limited um, excursions, if that answers your question. Thank you, Todd. And our last question comes from Catherine. Catherine, you are unmuted. Um, thanks so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, I'd love to know when you're developing your work in various stages from start to finish, how do you relate to or think about scale? And then sort of tangentially related, I'd love to know how you choose the bottles that you paint. I'll start with the first with the second question. So I choose the bottles that I chose the bottles that I painted um, mainly for their looks and the quality, the color quality of the liquor. So I would choose, I think there's even a, I think there's even a, what's it called? Um, just a minute, with A, the French drink that was forbidden for a while. Um, Huh? Absinthe? Absinthe, exactly. I think there's even an absinthe bottle somewhere because it has a green, if I'm not mistaken, it has green, it's green. Or there you go, that's absinthe. I chose that, you see the A. I chose that for the color of the liquor, that's the actual color. And it's called Absenta, which is a lovely name for absinthe, Absenta. And I used this Absenta logo in the black paintings. And the balvenie on the right, A, I love the whiskey, and B, uh, it just looks good. And then the dimple because of the bottle, and the parliament because of the bottle. And the one on the left also because of the bottle. So for the looks. And the Aperol clearly for the color. And the Campari, and that disgusting uh, chocolate liquor or something that's spilling, dripping out also for the, there. That's really disgusting. It's really cheap stuff. It's awful. But for the stain, so for their looks. Awesome. And the first question scale, uh, yeah, let's say in the, well, in the tree paintings, I would, I would want a certain scale, I'd measure it out on the wall and it, every scale is every one of these formats is a little different. Uh, I can't say, I would plan each, for each painting, I would, I would plan the scale for the painting I'm hoping to do. So I don't have a stack of formats uh, and then use it. I order them for each painting. I don't know if that answers your question, maybe. Yeah, thanks so much. 
All right, wonderful. Moving on to poetry. At The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Malva Kajali, to the stage. A, writing, uh, a writer living between New York and Chicago, Malva Kajali is the Special Projects Associate at the Brooklyn Rail and a regular contributor to the Southside Weekly, where she focuses on local culture and community history. Malvika, take it away. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, and thank you so much, Monica and uh, Tom as well. You know, you know likely that I think you're the finest interlocutor. Um, truly. Um, Monica, I love so much. Of course. Um, I love so much what you said about, you know, your paintings existing in the register of make-believe and the kind of world building and indexing of objects. Um, I just wanted to say we have you know, usually a lot of young artists in the Zoom, so your technical notes, uh, your aesthetic notes are you know, deeply appreciated. Um, I'm going to read one poem from a small manuscript in progress called In Dream Chicago. Um, so everyone be kind. In Dream Chicago, the Midway Plaisance is run over with lake water canals. The canals run over with paper boats. The paper boats unfold into letters from everyone you have ever longed after in the night, writing to say they have been missing you all this time, ever since, and still. In Dream Chicago, the streets are lined with mulberry trees. Beneath them, your parents do not age, they're young forever, always chasing you, um, never giving up, working late hours because they still can, and lounging in their gardens because such are the spoils of youth. Countless people are alive still in Dream Chicago. They are, they are. Day one, since always. We celebrate by giving them their flowers while they're here and pouring out shots of Malort directly into their mouths. In Dream Chicago, it is always the World's Fair. In the first weeks of spring, we walk out past the limestone, out past the ice. We knot our hands together into a web and together we walk out onto the lake and then we come home. In Dream Chicago, our lighthouse is manned by the blind. They sit facing the lake with their boots kicked up on the radiator, reading slim paperback novels with their hands and seeing out onto every side. In Dream Chicago, you ask for a two-day holiday and receive the full lifeblood of summertime. Half cakes are the currency of friendship. We drink horchata amid, amid prairie grasses in a Mexican restaurant that is really the backyard of a clapboard house. To reach your table, we walk through the clockwork, the clockwork heart of a house where children are growing young and old, young and old, because in Dream Chicago, X is Y, Y is Z, and Z is something else altogether. In Dream Chicago, you climb up the stairs of the Nowhere apartment and run your palms along the aubergine walls, lined with lipstick kisses. The woman on the inside doesn't care that your feet have helped themselves right into her home. She is thrilled, and she gives you a tour, and it isn't until the night, as you wash off your face in the mirror, that you notice a trail of feathered touches behind your ears. Black currant, red currant, mulberry, in Dream Chicago, the longest living woman in the city lives in your very own apartment building. You read it in the free paper on your way home from school. And when you find her in the elevator that very same afternoon, you say, excuse me, aren't you the longest living woman in the city of Chicago? The one who lives in my very same building? And she exclaims, thank you, Tom. And she exclaims, yes, yes, I am. So good of you to recognize me. It's been such a very long time. And feeds you slices of buttered pastry on her coffee table on the second floor beneath a painting of a boy and some peaches, each clasping the other in its flush palms. Her name is Thora, and in Dream Chicago, she is alive and holding the title still. In Dream Chicago, she remembers you when you move away. Her daughter moves into the apartment on the second floor with some children, two boys, because in Dream Chicago, there are no landlords, just like there are no locks and no lock keepers. One day, she gives you the painting of the boys, the peaches, in the new painting, it is a small Indian girl, and in place of the pastoral scene, she's in an elevator with the oldest woman in the world. They're eating thick pieces of lemon cake. From the east, the hum of the cardamom-scented lake, and in the dark of their mouths, something starts to smile. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bravo, Malvika. It's such a treat to listen to your poetry and to be the first one to listen to a poem from this manuscript. And of course, thank you, Monica. Thank you, Tom. 
Thank you to everyone who tuned in today and for all of your questions. Join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading in celebration of Lawrence Ferlinghetti, featuring Will Alexander, Garrett Caples, Neely Tchaikovsky, Aggie Falk, Jack Hirschman, Kay McDonough, Jackson Measle, Margaret Randall, and Ann Waldman. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.